Hi and welcome to The Honest Channel. I'm Claire Johnston, a 50-year-old journalist on a mission to learn and share how to age well and look and feel better for longer. But how far do we need to go to look good for longer? The global medical aesthetics market was estimated to be worth nearly $14 billion in revenue terms in 2022. That's forecast to increase dramatically over the next few years. There's big money to be made in that business. But is it an industry that's just stoking and preying on our insecurities about the way we look as we age? Or is it actually supporting us to age how we choose as individuals? Can the prices really be justified? And why are they so high? Here to discuss some of these big questions are two of my favourite aesthetics doctors. They're Dr Emmeline Ashley and Dr Chen Xu, both highly qualified specialists with a great deal of hands-on expertise in this field and you can find out more about them in the video description. And before we get into the discussion, if you enjoy watching the channel, then the best way to support it is to subscribe if you haven't already and give my videos a thumbs up to help widen their reach. Hit the notification bell and you'll be alerted to all my future video releases, including an interview I filmed in New York last week while I was visiting the city. And it's with cosmetic surgeon Dr. Richard Westrick about one of the fastest growing procedures in the industry facial fat transfer. It's a very enlightening conversation and you won't want to miss it. You also won't want to miss today's discussion. So let's hear now from Dr. Emmeline and Dr. Chen as they take on some of the biggest questions facing the aesthetics industry today. Dr. Emmeline, Dr. Chen, it's good to be back with you both again. Good to be really here. great to be back with you both. With an all new conversation and I'm going to be a little bit tougher this time because we're asking some of the big questions in aesthetic medicine. As practitioners of aesthetic medicine, it's your job really to help people feel better about the way they look by delivering rejuvenating, anti-aging facial treatments that are designed to tighten skin, smooth wrinkles, replace lost volume. But while there's a huge demand for these services, there's always going to be a contingent of people who view this as unnecessary and might even go as far as saying that the industry is profiting from the insecurities of patients and potentially making them worse through marketing of treatments that portrays visible age or visibly aging skin as something undesirable. So I'm going to start with you first, Dr. Emmeline. Are you capitalizing on the insecurities of aging men and women and potentially even heightening their anxieties? So I have so much to say about this. First of all, that is a very, very valid and a very fair question and an important question to ask. And I, I think, again, to be fair and to be honest, there probably are practitioners out there who do exploit people. Um, for me, there's two really important things that I keep in mind whenever patients come into me. Um, it's that a lot of people come to you from a place of vulnerability. It's a privilege to be a doctor, a medical professional. You need to look after anyone who comes to you, especially if they're vulnerable. And that's why having a really strong ethical baseline is so important. And it's also why um, having a medical model when you treat people, you know, even if you're doing cosmetic treatments, particularly when you're doing cosmetic treatments, that is non-negotiable. So when I talk about the medical model, what I mean is that as a doctor, I never do anything that's not in the patient's best interests. And in aesthetics, what we have to remember is we're often not talking just about physical well-being. We are talking about emotional, psychological, and social well-being, which is really, really complex mm -hmm. um, and very individual. And, and again, that's where you can get bad practice in aesthetics. I mean, clinicians are motivated by other things, and they forget to look after a patient's emotional and psychological health. The other thing that I think is really important to say is that helping someone's insecurities is not a bad thing. I think we put this endless pressure on people, particularly women. These There are these standards that we constantly have to twist ourselves into, um, in, into pieces to meet. And yes, sometimes a big part of that is beauty standards, which is very relevant to aesthetics, and we have to be aware of that. That's why exploring a patient's reasons for coming to you is really important and what they want to achieve, why they want to achieve it, respecting natural anatomy, understanding the aging process. But I think another part of that is, which doesn't always seem to get acknowledged, is this idea that there's a standard that we have to always be confident 
and comfortable in our own skin at all times, or it's a personal failure to be insecure in any way. I think it's very human to have insecurities and to admit you have insecurities and you're allowed to have insecurities. I have insecurities. Like a personal story about me, about when I started first getting aesthetic treatments, like I know I'm in my thirties, the aging process is just beginning for me. I won't pretend to know what it's like to get older, but I think I've had little tastes of what it, it probably will be like for me. So I spent the pandemic as an A&E doctor, as I know a lot of my um, colleagues, you know, were frontline or working in healthcare. Um, and I'll be honest, it took a massive toll on my physical and mental health. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking after myself. Um, I did a lot of nights and weekends, uh, the stress of what I was going through. Um, it was reflected in my appearance. So I personally found it very confronting to look in the mirror and not recognize myself and look at photographs and just say, oh, that's not, that's not me. Like, who is that tired, miserable shell of a person? And part of my personal recovery process um, from burnout included aesthetics. It was part of looking after myself again. And also part of actually having that mindset of saying like, you know what, you deserve a good night's sleep. You deserve to have um, a nutritious meal. You're also allowed to do nice things for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, things that make you feel better about yourself. Our faces are the way that we interact with the world. It's the self that we present to the world and we are judged about it. Like, let's be honest. Um, it's very easy to be a nuanced and judgmental and belittle aesthetics as something that's fake. But at the end of the day, everyone takes pride in their appearance if they're able to. You know, we cut our hair, we choose our clothes, we wear makeup or don't wear makeup. We present ourselves in a certain way and we are able to choose how we present ourselves. It's just another part of our story. I'm just going to say mm -hmm. is I think it is a completely valid viewpoint and I completely respect it if you think these treatments are unnecessary and they're not for you. But that's the point. They're not for you. You don't get to decide for other people what they do with their bodies and their health. And what I have found a lot of time is that this is directed specifically at women. Let me tell you, men get aesthetic treatments too. And there isn't the same conversation or scrutinizing. So I find a lot of the conversation around aesthetic treatments sometimes very patronizing. People say, oh, well, no one ever says these poor brainwashed men, they don't know their own minds. They don't know any better. We shouldn't allow it. We should decide for them. Like I have amazing women who come into my clinic, you know, they're business women, lawyers, single moms. Like these are women who know in their own minds and they can make their own decisions. I, I've had someone say to me, um, isn't aesthetics all about women just trying to make themselves look good for men? And I was just thinking about this patient I saw recently who was, she's, oh my gosh, she's fabulous, in her 80s, swept into clinic, immaculate in her gorgeous like coat and her clothes. She's in for a little sprinkle of Botox. She's living her best life. If you told her she's doing all this for the attention of men, she'd literally laugh in your face. Um, so so that that's my little spill right One there. of these times she comes into clinic, I, I must come in and interview her. I'm sure people would love to see oh her on God, the panel. Me. Well, you know what? You talked about judgment there. Dr. Chen, do you think that we can be uh, uh, judged by showing our age, particularly as women? I say that as somebody who works in media. You know, I've never felt from other people, from what they're saying, that there's overt ageism. But whether it's me projecting this onto other people or not, I feel like if I looked a lot older, you know, at 50, if I if I really looked 50 and then some, you know, would I feel as relevant in the job and appear as relevant to other people when it's all digital, it's all, you know moving with the times and the other side of it for me is I just love that we can I love that we get to choose but I mean what, what do you think Dr Chen when it comes to people's insecurities and feeling judged and then so like there's the problem the cosmetic industry has come up with a solution but are we just are we just perpetuating mm. this scenario this week's discussion is so interesting it's it's very deep and it's very complex and I'm sure we can be here for for hours discussing this and first of all I just want to say wow Dr Emily <laughs> like you just hit the nail on the head there like everything you've said I absolutely agree with um so in terms of insecurities and being judged um 
I think, as Dr. Emmeline said, everyone has insecurities and the insecurities are not necessarily just about appearance. I think because we're, we're talking about aesthetics, so we're talking about people's insecurities and their appearance. But, you know, in in reality, people are insecure about lots of other things as well. We don't talk about those. Um, and if we can do something to help people feel more confident, feel better about themselves, feel happier, um, that's I don't think that's a bad thing. So. Um, and then there's this issue of how we're judged, how society judges us based on our appearance and how sometimes we judge ourselves based on what we see in the mirror. And those are really interesting things. So I've always found the psychology behind aesthetics really interesting. And then this thing about age and looking a certain age is, you know, I, I spent my, most of my 20s trying to look older because in the hospital, you know, being a sort of a new doctor, even though I was a qualified doctor, very capable, people kept on asking me, oh, which college are you from? Especially the older, the older patients. And I used to think, you know, I didn't look credible because I looked too young. And now I'm approaching 40. Um, I'm really glad that I look younger than 40, you know, so it, it's a it's a strange thing. I know lots of friends clients, um, colleagues, people who are very young at heart, they've got this very youthful spirit. And so when they look in the mirror and they see an older person looking back at them that doesn't fit with how old they feel, mm. there's that disconnect. For an individual to have that disconnect, that that body image that they have in their head, if it doesn't match what they see in the mirror, that it, it makes it just screws with their head it makes their head go crazy like it, it it can really be upsetting for some people i've seen this happen and this kind of has happened a little bit to myself as well especially to women who have been really busy raising a family devoting their life to, to other people working really hard they don't take much notice of themselves and what can happen is that one day they sort of suddenly they stop and and they look in the mirror and they don't recognize that person looking back at them um it can be really upsetting and it's not that they're superficial or you know that they, they want to look a certain way for someone else it's just they just don't recognize that person looking back at them and that's a real issue and you know and that's the kind of thing that i think having the appropriate aesthetic treatments with the right assessment and the right guidance and and the right encouragement as well and doing it in a really positive way we can actually really make a huge difference positive impact for those people um and for me my my take on aesthetics is and, and actually the majority of my clients are women like me most of them are in their mid 30s to maybe mid 50s majority of my of my clients um they might be uh, mums they might be going through a divorce or have gone through a divorce they might be single or they might be in a relationship um and they just need that extra confidence boost the professional women very successful they're not doing it just to please a man and <laughs> they are completely doing it because they are empowered they want to look their best because they are actually in the prime of their lives they're successful they've got everything else they wanted and now they just want to you know sp spend their disposable disposable income on themselves and they want to feel great and i would want to do the same you know i think there's nothing wrong yeah. with that i'm surprised when you say the majority are mid 30s to 50s i and i suppose in my mind for, me. Thought for your for your client base yeah but i, I wonder uh, dr Emmeline, are you are you seeing a similar client base or are they um, depending on where i'm working so um i do have a social media following so when i am working in my own clinic in london it tends to be younger people so probably 20s to 30s when I'm working at the clinic that I work for in Edinburgh, which is a fantastic clinic, very well established, have a really well established client base. I mean, it actually does tend to be an older age group. So like 40s to 60s, actually. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. Is amazing. Big range of people. Well, I think yeah. it depends a lot on where the clientele actually comes from, because yeah. for the last, I'd say, five years, I've not openly advertised. So all my new clients come through word of mouth and referrals. And so I tend to get very similar people referred to me because the people I'm already seeing are of that age group and yeah. of a similar kind of situation. So just kind of by self-selection, really, um, my, my clientele tend to be that in that age group and very similar, similar to my existing clients and similar to myself, really. So, and that's what I love doing. Well, you just can't help but wonder if, if you know, if you're in your 30s or whatever, you're not just gilding the lily because you've got kind of naturally youthful skin. And do you think that there are cosmetic treatments that you're doing? from those ages that um so, that can make a difference um, 
I do a lot of skin treatments. So I started off doing injectables, but actually now the, the bulk of what I do is actually skin rejuvenation treatments with a little bit of injectables here and there if needed. So someone in their mid thirties, for example, maybe microneedling is, is all they need and, and good quality skincare. Mm -hmm. um, and then approaching sort of early 40s, maybe adding in a little bit of cheek filler, for example, a little bit of Botox in those who are very expressive. Um, and then considering kind of um, other skin lifting treatments like all therapy or thermage or, you know, radial frequency microneedling, those kind of things. So what I can offer now is a lot more broad than just simply Botox and fillers. And I think um, traditionally when people talk about aesthetics they are automatically thinking about the botox and fillers yes it is injectables but it's also the skin rejuvenation treatments and um even lipolysis um fat dissolving injections which some people are against but i think in the right people in the right areas it can be really helpful just to help kind of sculpt certain areas so there are lots of different treatments out there you know laser yeah. treatments treatments acne pigmentation all these things that most of aesthetics is not about um big lips and big cheeks um but when people think about aesthetic treatments that's the first thing they think of and they think oh yeah. why would people want to do that well if that's all it is then even i would ask why would people want to do that but that but aesthetics is so broad and there's so many things we can do and a lot of it is about preventing aging so preventative medicine actually dr Tremlin, from a health perspective to what extent do you think aged skin is actually damaged skin that we should see as something we can and that we maybe even should treat in this day and age. There is a school of thought out there that says aging in general should be treated as a disease that we can help um, prevent and even offset some of the worst symptoms. I mean, do you see skin aging like that? So I think if you want to be honest and purely biological, Biologically speaking, aging is the disease process. It's a pathological process. Aging is the breakdown of every organ in our body. If we want to be purely scientific about it, you know, let's be real. You don't have to look at it that way. And, and I don't necessarily look at it that way, but that is what aging is. It's the mm -hmm. breakdown of the body. Now, there are intrinsic and extrinsic factors to aging. So there are things that contribute and speed up aging that can be prevented. Um, which is, you know, a big focus of aesthetic medicine. I don't sit around with my patients saying, you know, aging is just this cold, inevitable march towards death. Like, of course <laughs> I don't. Aging, aging is also a privilege. You know, it's a beautiful privilege. Um, I hope I get to experience the full aging process as I do with anyone I love. Like I, you know, in medicine, I'm a doctor. I've worked in different fields um, in emergency medicine. I've encountered people who don't get the chance to age. So I do think aging is a privilege. And I think that's a very healthy way to look at it. Um, I think it's a misconception. Some people say cosmetic doctors or cosmetic medicine aesthetics is about denying the aging process. It's the opposite. We're acknowledging it and then we're doing something about it. I think there are plenty of medical things that we do that are denying the aging process that are just accepted and don't get the same scrutiny. So, you know, so no one gets criticized for getting reading glasses as they get older. You're not told you need to embrace the natural aging of your eyes, you know, take those glasses off. Um, we surgically replace hips and knees so we can walk without pain as we get older. No one says, oh, that's cheating. You just need to age gracefully. Um, but as soon as this bodily autonomy shifts to female aesthetic concerns, then it's like there's this narrative shift. And, and look, we, of course, have to acknowledge there are really real pressures that exist in the world um, in terms of preserving youth and beauty, especially if you're a woman. Um, but I think in a lot of industries, if you're career driven and successful, there is a very real pressure to remain young, which you touched upon yourself, you know, in terms of like this idea of being like vital and well presented. Um, Relevant. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We have to acknowledge it. And as we navigate society, the way we present ourselves is really vitally important to how we're perceived and potentially where we get in life. Um, so I don't know if you ever heard of Madame Noel. She was one of the first female plastic surgeons. Oh my God, she's amazing. Her story mm -hmm. is so interesting. And she was a suffragette and she worked really, really hard to make sure that women got the right to vote. So she was a surgeon in the 19th century, which was almost unheard of like as a mm -hmm. woman. 
And she saw plastic surgery as a feminist concept. She said that women deserve autonomy over their own bodies. And she saw as her work as a way to support women and allow them to maintain their professional livelihoods and their independence. And, and she's like, look, anyone who's watching this, like, look her up. She wrote extensively and really passionately, passionately about this. Maja she, Noel. I'm feeling her. Yes. I'm feeling those oh words. my God, I feel her. Um, and she saw, you know, plastic surgery and aesthetic medicine as empowering because she said it's about giving women a choice the same way that she was so um, adamant about, you know, vote. It's about choice. Mm-hmm. You don't have to do it, but you should have that choice. Uh, Dr. Chen, presumably mm-hmm. you would agree with that. <laughs> Um, absolutely. And I, I think um, I wanted to kind of touch on this earlier, which I, I think the issue that a lot of people have with aesthetic treatments is that it doesn't seem like it's a necessary thing. You know, if you need a hip replacement because you can't walk, it helps reduce pain. Um, like it's it's a needed kind of medical procedure and, and aesthetic treatments are seen as not really needed. Like it's not it's not essential. You can do you can do without it. You know, you can have bad skin but so what kind of thing that obviously depends on who that bad skin belongs to because for that individual it could really affect them in a really negative way Mm -hmm. but the the other thing is that aesthetics are private treatments you have you go to a private clinic and you've got to pay for it you can't you know you can't get it on the nhs it's it's not something that you can just have for free right so you you know people do pay a lot of money for these treatments and some clinics and practitioners they they do make a lot of money from doing these treatments so i can i can see where um some people might have an issue with this and they start to question you know are you just capitalizing on people's insecurities well it, it depends on what you mean by capitalizing right because if you're running it as a business as a private business you have to be able to cover all of your costs and you know, for a doctor offering these treatments, we've got all the training that we've had to pay for out of our own pockets, um, the insurance that we have to pay for, the, the quality products that we pay for, renting a premises, um, the time that we spend. There are lots of things that um, we directly have to pay, lots of costs involved. So if you look at it simply from a, a business perspective, that explains why these treatments cost so much. And you know, a beauty therapist down the road who's willing to charge half that price, there's a reason for that. They might be working from home and not having to rent a premises. They might be using cheap products. They've not had to go through all the training that we've gone through. I think what people have a problem with is this question of, are we taking advantage of people? I think that's a very different question. And there may be practitioners who are, there are all sorts of practitioners, but I believe most practitioners are not taking advantage of of their clients um and especially if we take a very medical approach to aesthetics and we rather than taking a transactional view and just giving people what they're asking for if we're actually doing a proper medical consultation um understand taking the time to understand what their concerns are and the reasons behind them wanting to have the treatment sometimes they might come in wanting botox but actually the area of concern is not something that botox can sort out they might need a different treatment so if we can take this medical approach and we can really advise people on the best course of treatment for that particular concern that they have um and also at the same time identifying any vulnerable patients if they have body dysmorphic disorder for example um if they are doing things for the wrong reasons if they're just not understanding the treatments and and we believe it's it's not going to help them and we say no to them i think if we take all those precautions and then if the patients still want to go ahead with the treatments and they're happy to pay for for that i don't see anything wrong in that um we are simply providing a good quality service to help that individual i suppose it's weighing up between was the demand there and the industry meets the demand or did the in- industry create the demand by by saying look you've got aged skin and that's a problem that needs fixing there's um, you know, to be honest there's probably a little bit of both whenever things are in the private sector you know um, people having to pay for things um there's always going to be this kind of you know let's drive the demand um drum up more business kind of thing but at the end of the day when people come to us for that consultation it is still down to the practitioner to decide whether that treatment is appropriate or not and to have that level of ethics to say no when it's a wrong treatment for them 
that I think that's that's the most important bit. It doesn't matter. The demand is always going to be there, and perhaps it was hidden before. Maybe there's just more awareness of it. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I I don't think that increase in demand is necessarily um, a bad thing or even a new thing. But I, if we look at back in the day, the film stars used to tape their their faces. There's always been a desire to yeah. um, to look younger. And now we just have better ways of doing it. I'm going to come on to another big question now. Um, Dr. Emily, I'm going to put this one to you. What, in your view, does good ageing look like? Because, I mean, there's been a lot of debate about Madonna's changing looks in recent years. And, um, you know, again, she recently, a recent appearance at the Grammy Awards, it was picked up on. And she comes back and she kind of hits back against what she calls ageism and, and misogyny when these these comments come up. But um, Kira Knightley kind of jumped in on the back of all this criticism and said, how are we culturally meant to age? You know, which is the big question, isn't it? What is good aging if we can't, we can't even agree on it? I mean, what, what does good aging look like to you? So I will circle back to that medical model that I uh, referenced earlier. Good aging means optimizing your physical, psychological, emotional well-being. And that's a very individual thing. And it's Mm -hmm. going to look like different things to different people. Um, I completely understand the debate around celebrities. And I have been asked in the past to comment like publicly or speculate about what someone has had done, sometimes in quite a negative way. And I, I have made a conscious effort to try to stay away from that. Um, I do understand when people see things where natural anatomy looks like it's been distorted, the aging process hasn't been respected, like it is alarming. And of course, it's a topic of conversation. Um, But when I see things like that, or when I see something that um, looks like obviously bad work, I never want to judge or criticize the person. I always see it as a failure of the medical profession or a failure of whatever doctor was supposed to be looking after that person and and didn't say no to them. As Dr. Chan just Mm -hmm. said, being able to say no is is a really important ethical boundary as a doctor. Um, I, I love Kiara Knightley. I think she's absolutely right. It doesn't matter what we do as women. If we age with intervention, it's going to be wrong in some people's eyes. If we age without intervention, it's, you know, going to be wrong in some people's eyes. You know, you're not allowed to ever show white hairs or wrinkles or whatever. So from that, I take do what you want. And I would say to other people, you know, stop being so judgmental. Um, When you're criticizing women and a lot of times, like, unfortunately, it is other women who are the most vocal question whether there's a little internalized misogyny there or a fear of aging. Don't be bothered seeing someone else out there living their best life. Like just focus on yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I would say to anyone else, you know, as we already stated, you will probably get judged or criticized no matter what you do. So just, just do what you want. And if you're a clinician providing these treatments, you know, make sure that at the forefront of anything that you do, it's not about making money or whatever. And I understand we are, in a private business, of course, we have to think about paying our bills, etc. But your most important, you know, calling as a doctor is your duty of care. So just look after the people who are, you know, trusting you enough to come to you and recognize that that's a privilege. With people like Madonna, I mean, she's always had a really striking look and she's always pushed boundaries and she makes her image like an art form. And so, you know, I feel with her, if she is happy with that look, you know, it's striking. There's something about it. It's very Madonna. And I think, well, what, you know, why not? Why do we have to have a go about it? It's it's up to her as an individual, isn't it? How she wants to look and how she wants to sort of, she's always been a trailblazer. So, um, yeah, I think I think she gets in the net. But to be fair, when you were talking earlier about women always, always being the, the ones that are sort of picked over, Simon Cowell's face did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I think he's had his fair share of criticism too. (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Chen, I mean, how would you answer that question? Because, you know, on the other hand, I'm real on board with all this, but I think it's absolutely miserable to pick over every wrinkle, which is what when I hit 45 and the wrinkles started appearing, I was literally, you know, there's another one, blast, 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 you know, trying to do everything I could to to offset all the signs of aging. And I think I've kind of probably reached that point where 
you know, I've got to accept that my skin will age and I have to go with that. And I'm just, I'm just, um, you know, trying to, trying to do what I can to offset what I can and feel comfortable as I go. What, what in your view does good aging look like what would you like to achieve as you age i think good aging is very personal Mm -hmm. to what that means is very personal to each individual to me personally it's not about chasing after each wrinkle i have no problems with getting some wrinkles um i think for me it's about reducing those external extrinsic aging factors that can speed up aging because that's something that's within my control it's more preventative Mm. and i for me that is no different to me brushing my teeth twice twice a day seeing a hygienist twice a year um, looking after my hair you know i go to the gym regularly i look after my body my fitness um looking after my skin is an extension of that there's no different no difference at all so that's that's how i view things i think with certain aesthetic treatments that's more invasive that's where um some people start to have more problems with that and and you know if you're against it don't have it done but don't judge those other people who want to have some treatments just to to give them a little bit of an extra boost you know I've never had Botox in my upper face because I don't need it it's not because I'm against it some people are overly expressive and they just want to control those muscle movements a little bit because that's not representative of who they are and that's fair enough um I've had cheek fillers myself because I felt I needed it at the time um if I you know if I don't need something I won't do something just because I can and I think that is the key is don't do something just because it's available just because you can just do the right things for you, um, for your situation. I've had, I've had um, regular skin treatments. You know, people wouldn't look at me and they think, oh, you look done. You know, that's never... That, no, that's God, you look really natural. Um, and I think as long as someone looks great for their age and they are glowing from inside out, they're happy. I, I think, you know, that's a, that's a good thing and, and that they're aging well if they are happy with who they are. Yes. Lovely note to end on. The, the, the one thing that we missed out in all this as well is it's quite fun. It's just fun being able to play with all this, you know, yeah. and trying out new treatments and what works and what looks good on you. And it's just like having a different hair color. I agree. I, I feel like it's such a pleasure to have a job where you go into work every day and, you know, it's just it's positive vibes like the whole time. when I have patients come and see me and like it's just it's genuinely such a wonderful like experience and vibe when I'm in clinic in some ways like that's rare in medicine you know of course because of what we do but um it's it's great to be able to have such a potentially um positive impact on people okay thank you so much you're both as ever i mean this is one that we could talk about um for a long time and i'm going to be interested to see the comments see what others think um but it's been it's been great thank you so much pleasure thank you as always i hope you enjoyed today's discussion let me know what you think in the comments because i do love to hear your views and experiences you'll find information on both dr chen and dr emmeline in the video description along with links to my weekly blog and details of my own anti-aging routine for now thanks for watching and listening i'll see you next time